Needless to say, it's still a challenging time for all of us working in schools with COVID, um, other major global issues taking place, of course. Of course. Um, but I did hear the other day something that really um, uh, inspired me. I heard a quotation, not from Shakespeare this time, but from the American poet Edna St. Vincent Millay. And I put this up on the uh, screen here. I hope you can see it. Um, it's a lovely quotation that says, the younger generation forms a country of its own. It has no geographical boundaries. Um, and I think that's a really nice reminder to all of us that uh, so many of uh, the children that we're teaching, uh, the young people that we're teaching, do feel an affinity perhaps with the same sorts of needs and issues and ideas that recross really national and cultural barriers um, around the world. Um, and I think probably there's something similar in terms of the way that teachers interact with each other. Maybe we share some similar values and concerns, and that might be, dare I suggest, something particularly um, significant for teachers of English and of drama, which I imagine most of you out there are. Or perhaps um, your, uh, you call the subject English language arts or literary studies, whatever it might be. Um, so um, let's share those values and concerns. It is indeed a privilege to be here, uh, particularly as here in the UK, it is National Shakespeare Week at the moment. Um, so thank you again to Bethan for the introduction. Um, I've been asked to say just a little bit more about uh, who I am and why I'm here with you today. Um, so my name is Chris Green, uh, I'm a teacher. Uh, and I've taught, been fortunate enough to teach in a number of countries around the world. And I'm going to describe myself as having been steeped in Shakespeare, which I hope sounds just about right. I've uh, taught, directed and written about Shakespeare throughout my career for 30 plus years. Um, currently, as Bethan said, I'm head of faculty. Uh, my job title is Director of English and Drama at a school called the Perth School which is in Cambridge in the UK, about 60 miles north of London, the famous university city, of course. Um, and in my school and in my department, Shakespeare is absolutely at the heart of the curriculum. And we have a very strong emphasis on bringing together English and drama teaching in the classroom. We don't really see a divide between the two. And that's going to figure quite strongly in what I'm going to be talking about with you today. Um, I'm also principal examiner for English Literature A-Level, Shakespeare paper for one of the UK's major awarding bodies, uh, which means that I set uh, questions for students aged about 18 uh, on Shakespeare plays, and I lead the marking of exam papers as well. Um, I spend some time as trustee and director of the British Shakespeare Association, and I'm chair of the BSA's education committee, so very much engaged with the kind of nitty gritty of teaching Shakespeare in schools and colleges and indeed in universities. I'm director of studies for a summer school, which is held at uh, Churchill College in Cambridge, and that focuses very much on Shakespeare. Uh, and perhaps most significantly for me, and, and maybe the reason why I'm here, is the fact that I recently edited, huge privilege, edited um, an edition of Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice for the HarperCollins Classroom Classic series. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that series later on. Um, other work I've done in the UK involves working with the Chartered College of Teaching and the English Speaking Union, the National Association for the Teaching of Drama, the Queen's English Society um, and the Young Vic Theatre. But that's probably enough about me. Um, let me move on to my title today, um, which is a little bit lengthy and a little bit unwieldy. It's not very catchy. Um, so it's making the study of Shakespeare an active, relevant and enjoyable experience for all students in the classroom. Uh, I've included a triplet in my title, you'll notice, to those of you who teach English language arts as well. Um, I'm gonna be focusing on uh, key stage three to five, in other words, secondary school or high school level. So teaching to students aged between 11 and 18, although maybe a lot of what I'm gonna say could also apply to younger students and indeed to older students as well. And I've chosen this title because I think, in reality, the teaching of Shakespeare and the reception of teaching about Shakespeare is often quite the opposite to how I've described it here, as active, relevant and enjoyable. Um, I'd like you to think back, to begin with, to your own experience of Shakespeare in the classroom, the time when you first uh, sat down in rows at desks or whatever it might have been um, and were taught about Shakespeare for the very first time. Um, 
if you'd like to put into the chat, uh, I won't be responding to it, I'm afraid, but if you'd like to put into the chat um, what your most vivid memory of that is, then I'm sure it'd be very interesting for everyone to hear that so you know what did you what was your first experience how did you first experience Shakespeare and and what did you feel about that how did it make you uh, respond if you'd like to put something into the chat you're very welcome to do so um and then moving on taking it to the next level I'd like you to think about how your students today who you're teaching Shakespeare to first react to uh, Shakespeare, when you introduce his plays to them, when you start doing work, you know, what sort of reaction do you get? So please do put into the chat if you want to, it's not compulsory to do so. Um, there is a threat, isn't there, uh, to the arts and to the teaching of the arts globally. Uh, and that includes drama, it includes literature. And I think there's been some, uh, there have been some enormous shifts in culture around the world about the way that the arts are being received in schools. Certainly what we're feeling in the UK is something of a pressure to explain literature, to explain Shakespeare uh, to students, to parents. Um, we're hearing it from managers as well, um, to kind of put Shakespeare into a box, to make literature clear and easy and tick box. And of course, often this is exactly the opposite of what we should be doing. English sometimes doesn't fit into the requirements um, of schools and inspection systems. Um, drama in particular can sometimes be a cross-cultural discipline, one that goes against the mainstream of what schools are trying to put across. And it can be quite difficult to get that balance absolutely right. Well, I think that's the opposite of the way we should be thinking. Um, we should be trying to encourage students to engage creatively and imaginatively um, with Shakespeare and with literature in general. And there's a long tradition of encouraging teachers and students to approach Shakespeare in this creative way that really goes back to the 1960s. I put on screen here two favorite books of mine um, which are very much in that tradition. The first one is Teaching Shakespeare by the Shakespeare guru, uh, to use that word, Rex Gibson. And the second one is a book called The North Face of Shakespeare. It's by Jim Stredder. And both books, 20 or 30 years ago now, were beginning to encourage teachers to do more active work in the classroom with Shakespeare's plays and to encourage students to enjoy what they were studying rather than seeing... Um, a sort of removed, anatomized series of texts uh, in a book. So today's talk's gonna be very much about taking a risk with Shakespeare, enjoying encouragement, uh, encouraging enjoyment of his plays and encouraging students to enjoy the plays and the language. And I'm gonna get a little bit kind of uh, highfalutin and theoretical and say as well that Shakespeare's vision of tolerance and compassion and humanity is something that I think most of us would agree needs to be able to flourish and has probably never been more required in the classroom today. So there's very much a sociological aspect to the work that we're doing with Shakespeare too. Going on to where Shakespeare sits in school curricula, well, this of course will be very different depending on where you're working, um, the culture, the system, that you're working in around the world. Um, but I will say that in England, in the UK, and in many countries around the world, Shakespeare is very often the only named author to be compulsory on an English literature curriculum. And many students do find this compulsory study of Shakespeare uh, very frustrating. Uh, and it might be interesting for you to think about the number of adults you come across in real life who say that they actually hate Shakespeare. They hated doing Shakespeare at school, and as a result, they hate Shakespeare today. Um, and that's obviously a hugely missed chance for schools and for teachers and perhaps for society uh, when adults rejecting this liberal message that Shakespeare has to put across and have no chance to access it whatsoever. If we describe, if we take the definition of literature as the written expression of liberal values, it's only one definition, of course, but it's an important one, then Shakespeare's absolutely of the essence of this. Um, 
it was, it's always interesting to hear. It's a question I often put to my classes, to my students. Um, if anyone can suggest a work of literature which actually aims to spread extremist views, particularly right wing views, extremist right wing views, it's very hard to come up with something which presents literature as a vehicle for that, rather than as this um, sort of liberal vehicle instead. So let's embrace the positive message in Shakespeare. We're gonna be going on to have a look at a lot of practical techniques that you can use in the classroom when I've got, when I've got beyond my initial theorizing here. Um, but I put up on the uh, slide there, um, the front cover of a, of a favorite book of mine, the title's a favorite at least, it's Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. It's a bit of a work of pop psychology, but I think it's something that we should be doing with Shakespeare and encouraging students to do with Shakespeare. And I've also put up another book um, the wonderfully named, it's a wonderfully named author, uh, Fintan O'Toole, but it's a wonderfully named book, Shakespeare is Hard, but so is Life. Um, let's embrace uh, the difficulty in Shakespeare and encourage students to do that, but enjoy his work nonetheless. Now, as teachers, as lecturers, we're all required to focus on public exam requirements. You know, that's what our students want in the end. It's what parents want. It's what our managers want in schools. Uh, and of course, we owe it to students to give them the best start in life and to help them to get the best possible results. But um, we don't need to do that by lecturing and presenting to our students. We can encourage a creative approach to the teaching and study of Shakespeare. Um, and that is perhaps the best way for students to access the very highest level of thinking skills. Um, and gain those, those perfect results. Um, so I share personally the difficulty that I find with Shakespeare's plays with my students. You know, there's always gonna be difficulty there. It's something I think we need to own up to at the start of our work with students when we're teaching them Shakespeare. So a lot of pictures on this next slide illustrating something to do with social change and the curriculum. And there's no getting away from the fact that um, Shakespeare is a dead white male author. Uh, that's not a particularly fashionable place to be anywhere in the world at the moment. Um, even if we're revering to some extent the kind of the what we've inherited from previous generations, which is important for students to learn as well. But students today, as we all know, what those of us working in the classroom, wherever we are in the world, I would suggest, are, are in the grip of a set of social changes which absolutely intrigue and fascinate. You know, they are passionate about what's going on in the world. They want to discuss it. They want to put it on social media. Um, we're going through the biggest set of social changes since the 1960s, aren't we? Which is a long period of time, 60 or 70 years ago. Um, and wherever students are in the world, they are fascinated by movements such as Black Lives Matter. Uh, everyone's invited. They're interested in fluidity of personal identity. They're interested in... Uh, decolonizing the curriculum and the texts that they're being taught and what that says about the society that the texts are representing. They're interested in global conflict. They're interested in the mental health and anxiety issues that they see in young people around them, very sadly. Um, you know, to some extent, all these issues might be said to be a legacy of the position they've inherited from people in my generation and other generations. And I think, you know, we owe it to students to really consider that. Where did we go wrong? And what could we do to help put the world right? Well, I'm gonna suggest, again, perhaps rather grandly, that Shakespeare can help with this. Um, be really interested to know which plays you teach, um, which plays you're required to teach of Shakespeare. If you wanna put that in the chat box, it'd be very interesting for me to have a look at that later on as well. So you know, what are the popular plays in your school, in your college? Um, do you choose the plays yourself or are the plays on a curriculum or examination syllabus? Um, if you'd like to put this into the chat box, then please do. But at the bottom of my screen here on this slide, you'll see that I put um, scenes from five different plays that are suddenly becoming very popular uh, across the world. Five plays by Shakespeare. And I think that's largely a reaction to the political and social movements that are taking place uh, around the world. So I've got Othello on the left. I've got Titus Andronicus, that's Aaron the Moor. Uh, I've got The Taming of the Shrew, uh, a play very much to do with gender politics, of course, uh, as is the next play, The Merry Wives of Windsor. And then finally, I've got the character Shylock 
from Shakespeare's play, The Merchant of Venice. Um, all these plays deal with gender and with race in a way that can be absolutely key and relevant to students and fascinate them today, I would suggest. And I think the play that's maybe gonna dominate this approach, this discussion is indeed The Merchant of Venice, the play I've written about recently. And I'm gonna suggest later on in this talk that this could be an absolutely key text to use in the classroom for students of all ages at the moment and to get terrific results with. Now, I know that all of us as teachers, as lecturers work within the constraints of local political and social regulations and difficulties. We can't just teach what we want to and just say what we want to all the time. For example, here in the UK, teachers have a statutory duty imposed on them to be apolitical, to be unbiased in the classroom. And we really need to demonstrate that. And it's something that teachers, the teaching community has been, been pulled up on recently. We've been reminded of that. Um, and clearly with an awful lot going on in the world at the moment, uh, often we want to express our personal views, um, but, but, but we can't. Um, but I'm gonna suggest that the teaching of any Shakespeare text is still a possibility. Um, they're all seen as legitimate texts. Shakespeare is very rarely banned as an author. And even in some of the current contexts of censorship of the school curriculum, it's a strong word, but I'm gonna use it, censorship, which we see taking place in certain parts of the world, very rarely are Shakespeare's plays placed on that banned list. Um, I just to pluck one example um, off the top of my head, I'm thinking back to, um, Eastern Europe in the second half of the 20th century, when um, the majority of the countries were part of an Eastern European communist bloc. Shakespeare, of course, flourished, uh, was hugely popular, uh, was produced in theatres, was on school curriculums, uh, was quoted by political leaders. So I think Shakespeare tends to fit. It tend, he tends to be uh, kind of absorbed into any political system, any view around the world. And I think that's something that we can make the most of and, uh, and use to our advantage as teachers. So having a think about active approaches to Shakespeare and using drama, well, organizations such as the Rogers Company here in the UK have long advocated the need for students to stand up and perform when it comes to Shakespeare. They had a campaign about 10 years ago. They're still sort of moving the same theories forward as is Shakespeare's Globe, um, the recreation of Shakespeare's theater in, in, in the center of London at the education department there. They're, they're um, uh, expressing this idea that really students need to be standing up in the classroom and performing. And I think if your students aren't doing that, you wanna have a think about why, and maybe you want to have a conversation with your colleagues and with your managers about how that can be facilitated. Because I think nothing can be more off-putting for students than teachers boring on. I know I've done it about abstract details of language. And students need to appreciate not just linguistic, but also dramatic effects in these plays. And let's not forget that the plays were, of course, written for performance. It can be very easy to forget that. They're scripts, you know, they're not texts. They're scripts for adaptation and change, and they've changed over the years. Um, we tend to think of them as texts or indeed as set texts, which tends to be something of the kiss of death for any work of literature. Um, you know, every summer I mark, uh, I'm responsible for the marking of, of, of thousands of scripts, um, most of which are fascinating, inspirational, um, teach me an enormous amount about Shakespeare, but in just a few, I will read an awful lot about, for example, the punctuation in Shakespeare's texts. Texts. Um, you know, this might be a fascinating topic for a PhD thesis or beyond, um, but uh, it's not the first subject that we would hope students will be getting involved in when they're uh, being led through Shakespeare by their teachers. I mean, let alone the fact that most of the punctuation in Shakespeare's plays was edited and changed uh, much later on, you know, long after he wrote the plays. So let's inspire students with active approaches and drama techniques. And I'm gonna give you a long list of techniques quite soon. Um, but let me talk about one colleague in my faculty here who I work with, a really inspirational teacher uh, who teaches uh, Romeo and Juliet to 14 year olds every year. Um, and he does that by showing students, first of all, a film of the play, a complete film of the play. They have a bit of a film party. They bring in popcorn. Um, of course, they watch the Baz Luhrmann version of the play. Uh, I'm sure everybody out there will know it. It's 25 years old, that film, but it still hits 
uh, teenage students today like something completely new and completely fresh. Um, after that, my colleague will um, lead students in groups through the construction of an artifact to illustrate the play in some way. So they'll make their own film. They'll create a website. They might even put together a puppet show. Um, and he will not lead from the front on the text at all. Of course, there'll be loads of things about the play, about the detailed language of the play, um, that the students won't necessarily pick up on the first time. Um, but are those students gripped by Romeo and Juliet by the end of that four or five weeks of work? Absolutely, they are. Do they go on to actually perform better in exams eventually? Yes, they certainly do. So it's a risk to take, but it works. So don't study the whole play when it comes to Shakespeare. Have a look at key chunks of the play or even mix and match, match thematic elements from different plays. Uh, we offer a unit to our year eight students. So I'm talking about 12 to 13 year olds about strong women in Shakespeare's plays. We include um, Cleopatra, uh, Rosalind, um, some of the female characters in Richard III. So, and these are not plays that students of that age might usually be reading and studying in the classroom, but we do give them the chance to have a look at kind of threads that link different plays together. And at the same time, we're bringing in a key social issue. We're putting across a social agenda by including a discussion of women in Shakespeare's plays, women in Shakespeare's time, and indeed presenting role models of, of strong women. I'm sure Cleopatra is a role model in every sense, uh, but in some way she certainly is. Um, other things you can do, of course, you know, is to get students to research the fascinating authorship debate about Shakespeare's play. They absolutely love this. You know, who wrote the plays? Why were they written? Why were there, are there all these conspiracy theories about who wrote the plays? Um, they can look into meta theater. You know, what is it? Why was Shakespeare so fascinated by it? They can research social and historical context. These are the things will kind of hook students and draw them into the language eventually. I'm gonna add at this point that I think with, with an examiner's hat on, that I think there is one key element of Shakespeare's language, detailed element, that we do need to be presenting to students. It's kind of going against everything I've said so far. But I think a 15 minute lecture on um, aspects of Shakespeare's language like prose, verse, poetry, key terms, iambic pentameter, blank verse, terms that all of us use as kind of common currency to discuss Shakespeare. Um, you, know, you know, these are things that students really do need to know from the beginning. Uh, it's quite extraordinary, actually, even at uh, sixth form level when students are 18, beyond into university, so many students are unable to use those terms um, in a uh, creative way because they really don't understand the meaning of them. So it's well worth having your 15 minute PowerPoint about those particular topics ready. Uh, you know, even try and get students speaking in iambic pentameter, give them a chance. And it's something they want, you know, you actually have to work hard to stop them, stop them doing it at some point. Um, okay, so I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about some very practical ideas uh, in the classroom. What can you get students doing? Um, I would say absolutely use the original text of the play. Don't use a translation. Uh, either into their first language or into modern English. You know, use an abbreviated text by all means, but you do need to make sure that students are being immersed in the original um, uh, language of, of, of the Renaissance, of Renaissance English. Um, similarly, don't try and decode the meaning. Don't try and um, explain or paraphrase or uh, look for answers in the language, but instead try and encourage students to come up with a variety of different responses and interpretations. I certainly recommend film. I think film is hugely important. Live theatre is even better, especially now, as in many parts of the world, we're starting to emerge from the pandemic, you know, and performances are starting to begin again. Um, you know, for example, they're very old, but the animated tales, uh, cartoon versions, uh, which were made in Russia, in the 1980s and 1990s. They're 30 minute versions of the plays, but only using Shakespeare's original language. A fantastic way to introduce uh, students to a new play, perhaps before you start working on it with them. Um, of course, there's YouTube 
and other social media platforms available. Um, you know, there's a lot on there which isn't very useful, a lot which we shouldn't be showing students, but so much amazing material that we can pick out, selections and trailers and whole scenes and whole films. You know, use though that amazing resource uh, when you're introducing students to Shakespeare. Uh, I'm going to say act the plays. It might sound obvious, but that's what students need to be doing. Get them up, get them acting, get them performing in groups. You know, as we we're saying, it's a lovely spring day here uh, in, in England. Um, my class is this afternoon, they're going to be outside performing. Um, instead of giving modernized scripts to students, get them to write their own modernized scripts. It's a wonderful way for them actually pro to process what's going on in the play and then come up with their own ideas. Get them reading speeches around in class in different ways. Um, it's a kind of, it's a, you know, an ancient technique. Teachers have used it for centuries. It can be done well, it can be done badly. There's a lot of theorizing around at the moment about how to read round. You know, but why not cut spe uh, speeches up into single lines or indeed phrases? It's a great way of looking at the phraseology of speeches or even individual words. You know, get students sitting in a circle and perform the speeches round as a kind of shared exercise. Um, hot seating, another ancient technique, but one that works every time and students absolutely love. So one student sits on a seat at the front of the class, um, becomes the character, a particular character from the play, and the other students in the class get the chance to ask them in role questions, the sort of behind the scenes questions, the things you want to know. Um, but you're not told in the play. And the student can then empathetically kind of enter the mind of that character and speak, speak in role. And that's something that often works very well with quieter students, with shyer students, who will suddenly flourish in, in doing that activity. Um, what about picking lines from the play? A good intro introductory activity for Shakespeare. Before you've even read the play, ask students to pick maybe 10 or 15 lines from the play just because they love the sound of them. They may not understand the meaning, but get them to pick those 15 or 20 lines, whatever it might be, and then get students in groups and writing plays uh, on any topic they like, but using as many of those lines as they possibly can. And that's one way that they'll get into the world of the play without even knowing it, actually. And when those lines appear in the play when you're studying it, they will suddenly shine out uh, like beacons to them. Um, learning speeches by heart, uh, again, it sounds like a bit of an old fashioned technique. Maybe there's a speech from a Shakespeare play you can remember having learned when you were at school uh, that stayed with you forever. Um, a really important thing to do, a great way of getting inside the language, learning poetry, learning verse and speeches by heart is absolutely back in fashion um, and a really important thing for students to be able to do. So think about doing that as well. Um, Try staging scenes in different ways. Give the same scene to three or four different groups in a class, and then give them directions about how you want the scene to be. You want this to be a comic version. You want that group to be a tragic version. You want that group to do it uh, as a silent uh, comedy. And you want that group to do it as a dance, if you're feeling incredibly brave, and see how the four different versions of the same scene come out. Um, moving on to my second slide of these uh, kind of practical ideas, ask uh, students to go away and write monologues as if they are characters in the play. They can use modern English, but again, they get inside the character, they think through it, and they come up with some really good ideas. There's loads of room for projects and research and presentations, as I said earlier on, particularly about context. Um, students will enjoy, uh, you know, really getting into the background and the history. And you might find that certain of these projects work particularly well with particular groups of students. You might know one student in the class that you know will really enjoy researching performance history, for example, will give them that task to do. They can then feed back across the rest of the class. I'm gonna suggest as well that introducing critical views and literary theory and performance history um, is, is an important thing for students to be doing, and actually from quite an early age. Um, a lot of exam uh, specifications around the world require students to engage with these sorts of ideas when they get to the age of sort of 16, 17, 18, sixth form here in the UK. Um, but why not introduce those approaches earlier on? The idea that plays can be seen in different ways by different people. Um, different 
theoretical approaches to texts, feminist, Marxist, whatever it might be, uh, and indeed uh, getting students to research and to look at performance history. You know, when did uh, a woman first play Hamlet, for example, and where, where has that trend come from? So introducing that from, from early on will probably grab students as well. A um, few more ideas, they're in more or less a random order. Um, readings in groups, give an act of a play to a different group, ask them to go away or to, to sit with you if you prefer uh, in, in circles and to read around the play and then to feed back on that. They could give summarized versions. They could give summarized performances. They could take an act um, 20 minutes long or so and come up with a two minute performance version of that act. They can uh, perform dialogues in pairs. You know, very often you'll come across a scene in a play where you've only got the two characters, thinking, for example, the parts of Much Ado About Nothing. Um, you know, get pairs of students to rehearse and run through that. They could even learn some of the lines by heart. You know, that could be part of what they're doing. Um, ask students to read on in the play before you've done any work together as a class, to go away, to prepare some thoughts, to come back, to feed back the thoughts to everybody else, to a neighbour or even to the whole class before you go on and actually look at that uh, act in the play. Um, tell the stories. Um, you know, there are amazing stories uh, behind these plays. You don't need to look at the whole play. There are uh, great kind of prose versions going back to the tradition of Charles and Mary Lamb, although there are many more recent versions. Um, you know, tell the stories, read the story out loud. Uh, in modern English uh, to, to the students. Shakespearean insults, I think very few teachers of Shakespeare, particularly the comedies, uh, won't um, have used insults at some point. Shakespeare, the, you know, the greatest writer of insults in the English language, I would suggest. Um, in particular plays, you can find lists and lists and lists of them. The Henry IV plays, for example. The history plays very rarely done in classrooms, actually, sadly. Um, but you know, there are on you can find on the web all sorts of Shakespeare insult generators. Get them insulting each other. Get them coming up with their own insults. Um, you know, we're getting into the into the realm of, of drama as therapy at this point. Um, but there's nothing better than standing, perhaps with you in the middle, the teacher in the middle, uh, if you're feeling brave, and the students one by one insulting you using a Shakespearean insult. That's a that's a brave thing to try. Um, get students to make posters the plays get them to hold production team meetings you know you're going to be staging this play in a week's time here's a group you're the director you're the producer you're the art director you're in charge of costumes get them to come up with a a plan or a business model for staging the play um that you know again that will get them um implicitly looking at the play and what it's all about coming up with all sorts of new ideas um create a backstory for the characters um you know why does uh, Cleopatra have this uh, raging temper. What happened in her childhood? If you want to get a little bit sort of pop psychology about it, um, write the story of the characters in the past before the play begins, or indeed after the play ends, what happens to them next? Um, production reviews. Uh, if students have been to see a uh, performance of a play, or if they've watched a film, or they've watched something on YouTube. To um, introduce them to reviews from newspapers, from magazines, from the internet, and ask them to write their own reviews, develop their own style for doing that. Um, and finally, I'm suggesting to steal resources from others. You know, there are so many Shakespeare resources out there to use on the internet. Um, I could just pick three examples. I've already mentioned the Royal Shakespeare Company in the UK and Shakespeare's Globe Theatre in London. Um, but you've also got institutions like the Folger Library in Washington, D.C., full of the most amazing resources. They're also putting on webinars, all sorts of other things going on. Have a look at their websites um, and, and steal uh, everything they're offering for you to use. And of course, they're, they're the teacher's friend. You know, on a particularly busy day, you've got one minute left to prepare a lesson. Um, go, go to these places and, and, and they will provide you with the worksheets and everything you can possibly need. And I'm going to suggest as well, um, which I think I hinted at earlier on, that these approaches, these more active approaches, are something that we can also use uh, with students who are between 16 and 18, and even at university level. Um, you know, it's not anymore about sitting around in a circle uh, and discussing um, 
very earnestly the syntax of a speech. Which of course, there's absolutely room for that, and it's a key thing that students should be doing. But you know, use these active approaches with students of any age, I would suggest. Um, and finally, yes, you can teach practical academic skills like uh, making lists of quotations and embedding quotations in answers. And I would suggest that these things come better after the initial creative work is done. Um, students will quite easily um, get themselves up uh, with a lot of teacher help to, and a lot of hard work from them up to kind of the level below the highest grade in an exam. But to get to that very highest level, uh, marking criteria nearly always specify that there needs to be some kind of creative, original, imaginative, sophisticated response. Um, and I'm suggesting that accessing those higher order thinking skills um, is going to come about as a result of profiting from the creativity of students. So I'm heading towards the end. I want to talk a little bit about The Merchant of Venice because I've suggested that it's a great play to use to cover the social issues which students are so interested in at the moment around the world, social, historical, and cultural issues. Just a quick list here on the screen of uh, my interpretation of what the play uh, is treating, what it's about. Um, so there's a lot about gender relationships uh, and indeed the switching of, of, kind of gender roles in the play. Um, a huge amount of course about religion and race and the interaction of the two and about social marginalization. Um, intergenerational strife is there, you know, which teenager is not interested in that as a topic. Every one of them will have a story of some kind to talk about. Sexism, the patriarchy, um, you know, the place of women in a, a, a male dominated society, such as that as of Venice as Shakespeare presents it, and the way that they rebel against that. Uh, again, a topic that students will enjoy discussing, uh, whatever their view on that topic might be. Sexual morality, relationships of all kinds, the individual and the state, uh, the role of justice in a society, and the balance between uh, justice and mercy, which this play is about. Actually, the play is about the balance of all these different ideas. That's one of the wonderful things about it, of course, as you'll know, um, that uh, very often all these issues are considered on the cusp and that Shakespeare constantly manipulates us from one uh, extreme to the other. So we never quite know where we are, what our feelings are about these issues, which is exactly the place you'd like your students to be, to be thinking kind of actively and creatively. Climate change, you know, Venice, the sinking city, I believe, uh, a fascinating topic. Perhaps it's not dealt with, um, but I, th I think actually it is ships uh, sinking and, and um, getting lost on the, getting, getting stuck on, on the, the Goodwin Sands in the English Channel referred to in the play. So all sorts of issues that you could go to. And of course, physical suffering and mental health are absolutely at the centre of that play as well. Um, if you don't know the play, perhaps I should have started with this. I've just put a very quick story um, of the multiple plot strands of the play up on the screen, which I'll read to you. So you've got a central character, Antonio. He is possibly the Merchant of Venice, although you could say other characters in the play have that role as well. He borrows money, doesn't he, from the Jewish moneylender Shylock to enable his friend Sanio to woo the heiress Portia, who lives in the second location in the play, uh, which is a place called Belmont, uh, which is a name we find advertising so many products around the world. Belmont, you might know a Belmont uh, brand of biscuits in the UK uh, or a supermarket, but it's Shakespeare's invention, that name, Belmont. Um, as indeed is the name Jessica, incidentally, which appears in this play. Um, Portia, this Portia, in the meantime, she's fighting off a number of other suitors who are forced to take part in a test devised by her dead father. There's the patriarchy, if you wish it. And at the same time, we're shown the general disarray in Shylock's household back in Venice. All sorts of twists, turns, and subplots. Everybody ends up in this enormous courtroom scene in Act 4, Scene 1. Who doesn't love a courtroom scene? on stage or in a film, who doesn't love putting on a gown and a wig, you know, have one in your classroom when you stage the scene. Um, Shylock doesn't, of course, get the pound of flesh, which he's requested when Antonio cannot pay back the loan. Everybody, probably apart from Shylock, lives sort of happy ever after. Uh, it's one of those Shakespearean, rather contorted, happy endings, which in itself can provide all sorts of discussion. So you've got a lot of complex plot strands. I always compare Shakespeare's structure with my students to TV soap operas, where you've got maybe three or four plots, 
you know, one will stop at a, at a cliffhanger, another one will start, uh, then that will stop. You might go back to the first one, then you might bring in a third plot strand, really get think, students thinking in a different way about how narrative works, actually. Um, and it's a, a, a fascinating play for the current moment, I'm suggesting overall, with amazing, amazing characters. Um, on my next slide, uh, I'm showing you um, the Collins Classroom Classics range, which I'm not required to do, but I want to do. Um, my Merchant of Venice uh, is there in the middle of it, but these are terrific um, additions to use in the classroom. They're very simple, they're very straightforward. They have a simple brief introduction, which is accessible to students and indeed to teachers as well. Um, good detailed notes, uh, which is, it says that experienced teachers have written. Uh, they're very good value. Um, they're very portable. Um, I give them to students to write in and they keep these editions as well. And I think it's a growing series as well. But the whole issue of uh, editions of Shakespeare is, is a concern in itself. There are some editions, I'm not going to name them, aren't there? There's one very famous one, very scholarly academic one um, that originates in the UK, which famously has more notes than it has original text on each page. I have a question whether that is really useful to give to a student at any level, perhaps at university level, yes, but in schools, I don't think students need to be overwhelmed with quite so many notes to begin with. So think carefully about the edition that you choose. Um, also have a think about um, the exam that your student will be sitting, if it's gonna have a context passage on the paper, you know, which edition is that gonna come from? Have you prepared the students in the right way? Uh, looking at Hamlet, for example, a play with an incredibly complicated publication history of quartos and folios, and, uh, good quote, quartos and bad quartos and all the rest of it. Um, you don't want them sitting down to face a question um, based on a passage which they haven't seen because it's not in their edition. So just make sure you get that absolutely, absolutely right. Um, so I'm going to finish off with, uh, thank you for listening to me so far, I'm going to finish off with what I've called some grand concluding statements. And I think they are a little bit grand, perhaps they're even a little bit pompous. But I hope that what I've been talking about today um, makes some of these statements um, viable. Um, so what I'm suggesting is that Shakespeare requires us to embrace the complexity of life, which I think we're all entirely familiar with in the last couple of years, if we hadn't been before that. And life in Shakespeare's plays, as in the real world, is never simple or binary or straightforward. Um, and I think we know that teenagers would actually prefer it, most of them, if life were more straightforward, if there were clear answers. You know, Shakespeare's plays are going to open up questions for them. My thesis today is that this is something we should be embracing and making the most of. And that reading Shakespeare is going to help students to embrace the complexity of life and indeed of their own lives. We're back to literature and drama as a kind of therapy. Uh, and I don't throw that word around lightly because obviously uh, we need to be very careful when we're approaching texts in that way, but it can be the effect that they have. So Shakespeare's world, often a non-binary one, extreme views rarely provide the answers. And let's hope that's the case in the real world as well. Um, Shakespeare does, at least at times, present what we can infer to be a little way that humanity should be working. And he's often keen to point out the failings uh, in human beings as well when we don't achieve those things. Uh, we hear world leaders quoting Shakespeare at the moment, for example, uh, for good or for bad depending on our view and theirs. Um, and finally, perhaps my grandest statement of all, that our job, hopefully using some of these techniques I've been talking about today, is to make sure that, shape, that students can access this message here. And I'm even suggesting that it might be something of a moral duty uh, for us as teachers, on top of all the other moral duties we have and the, and the hard work that we have to carry out. So thank you very much indeed uh, for listening uh, to me today. I'm going to put the final slide up uh, which is from HarperCollins and gives you some information about um, how you can keep in touch, how you can sign up to more of these interesting webinars uh, and um, any other 
uh, anything else that you need to find out. So uh, thank you very much indeed for listening and I'll, I'll hand back to Beth. Um, so over to the, um, the Q&A. Um, so we've had a couple of interesting ones that have come in. So um, first of all, uh, just to start with, um, we have a question about how would you recommend Chris teaching Shakespeare in a, in an English as a second language setting? Um, so those that maybe aren't as confident with um, with the with the actual language, and you know, as we said, it's not necessarily all about the language. But how how would you implement that in an English as a second language classroom? Thank you, Beth. I mean, that's that's a really interesting question, and, and of course, a really important question. And, and uh, you know, to, su to some extent, I'm privileged in the fact that most of the students I'm teaching uh, speak English as a first language. But I I'd also suggest that um, Sh Shakespeare is, is a kind of, is, um, we are all approaching Shakespeare as, as second language speakers in, in terms of what his language has to say. Um, and, and I think, um, again, my main message of not getting too stuck on the details of the language, but particularly with uh, English as a, as a second language speakers, um, making sure that you're maybe getting the plot of the play across to your students, uh, first of all, sh showing them a film and making sure that they, they know what the main outline of what's happening in the, in the plot line, first of all, uh, and then going into some of the details of the language. But I, I don't, I think it's going to be a, a battle easily lost, actually, to try to explain the meaning of every single word. Um, have a think as well about the editions that are available. I think some editions of Shakespeare will be more suitable to second language speakers than to others. Um, they might explain words and phrases in, in a way that is more suited to your particular students. So I think it's really about um, the visual impact of the play Getting the, getting the plot across um, and choosing the additions that's going to be most suitable. And, and as, I think, as I said all the way through, and I know it's a bit of a cop-out in a way for me to say, you know, to tell your students, this is, this is going to be tough and you're not going to understand it all, but, it, but enjoy what you can of it. Yeah, no, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, we've also spotted in the chat box, it seems to be um, that quite a few um, attendees today um, are studying Othello with their class for with IGCSE. Um, so are there sort of any recommendations that you would have particularly for teaching Othello? Yes, well, thank you. That's that's interesting as well. Um, it's it's not a play that um, I've seen featuring on UK specifications for for a long time. But I mentioned it earlier on in connection with the obvious race issue in the play. Um, so that might be one way into it, uh, looking at uh, what the play has to say to us today about race uh, and how that relates to the particular culture that you're working in. Um, but there's also a huge amount in the play, isn't there, about about gender too about the place of Desdemona in, in this very kind of male world that she's part of. Um, and I would also suggest as well to look at the play in terms of, um, of leadership and government um, and indeed conflict uh, on a global level, which the play is very much about. And they are all absolutely, uh, you know, bang up today issues uh, for us today. Um, you know, a lot of Othello is, is, is difficult. It's, it's, it's dense poetic language at times. So again, maybe uh, if you're introducing the play to, to get beyond that to begin with, to start with the big issues, to start with the plot line, um, and then maybe to get into some of the details of the language as, as you move on. Yeah, fantastic. But a great place to teach students. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and then, um, so one of our um, one of our attendees here, we spotted in the chat box as well, um, said that they learned Romeo and Juliet in school, as as many of us probably have. I know myself, I did too. Um, and it's quite, um, it could be quite a daunting and and scary experience for if you're just given sort of the language in front of you or without sort of any context um, and stuff. But also about um, the the topics as well that are brought up. It might be that you know you ne you've never come across the intense love that that is shown in in Romeo and Juliet, or we, in fact death um, that is that is discussed in that in that way as well. Um, so, ha is there any sort of tips that you have as to introducing? Um, introducing this into a younger audience or um, how, how would you go about introducing something that's got quite complex adult adult topics? Um, how would you go about the first steps to introducing it? 
Yes, thank you. An another really interesting question when all of these are. Um, yes, I, I, I think actually I would be really careful teaching Romeo and Juliet to uh, a, a really young class. I know it's sometimes taught in, in primary schools, you know, that's before the age of 11, um, where, you know, it's hard to say it's not suitable. Um, but I think even in the lower years of, of secondary or high school, you need to be really careful with the play because it does deal with themes of, um, of suicide and death and violence. Uh, and, and as you say, Bethlehem, I think the, you know, the, the experience of the intensity of love in that play is maybe something that a lot of young people are unable to access at that time. Um, I think if you do use the play, I would be very selective with it. I would choose certain bits of it. I mean, the big, I think it's at three, scene one, the big white scene that takes place. Um, dare I say it can actually be great fun to stage in a class. Um, but I think some of the more intimate scenes uh, you do need to be really careful with. And I think that's where, um, you know, all, all the skills that were required to put in place as English teachers really come into play because you are going to end up having to deal with some very intense emotional issues. Um, and I would say lead students gently through the kind of emotional concerns that the play is bringing up about their their first romantic feelings and if you're teaching the play to to uh, adolescents kind of middle teenage years there'll be very very raw feelings on the surface for them so um i'm not sure if i provided an answer to that but i'm saying take care with the play be careful yeah yeah and introducing the themes maybe before before straight into into actually learning about about the plays as such too that's it's a it's a really good idea and as you said before introducing the plot um then, then taking its process um, through the stages of teaching Shakespeare. Um, Absolutely, yes. So, so yeah, I think we've got time for maybe one more question that's come through too um, on the Q and A. Um, so, um, if if Shakespeare isn't compulsory on um, exam specifications, um, do you still rep recommend opting um, for his work rather than something that's maybe uh, easier or, or different? I think I would say yes to that. I would say, I, I mean, I know in a lot of specifications, you don't have to cover Shakespeare. Um, I would say, why not go for it? Because I think we do have that duty to introduce our students to the greatest writer in the world, uh, I'm gonna call him. Um, and um, I think also there might be something to be said for the fact that challenging material, challenging texts and can sometimes encourage students to perform to the very best of their ability in exams. I know it's really difficult to you know, come up with a kind of hierarchy of what, what's difficult and what isn't, particularly on exam specifications. And officially, every text on an exam specification is of the same difficulty and, and examiners will never kind of discriminate between them. But I think offering something that initially seems slightly more challenging to students might, in the end, after a couple of years of work on it, enable them to perform even better at the end. So I, I would go for the Shakespeare, yes. Well, I would say that, wouldn't I? <laughs> well, only slightly biased, but it seems that there's so much support out there too for for if you have chosen to to, to opt with Shakespeare too. You know, it, you wouldn't be a teacher alone in in doing so. Um, for the support for for teachers and for um interpreting it to the class too. So, yeah. Um, for now, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much, Chris, and thank you very much for everyone who has joined us today. And we look forward to seeing you again soon.